Raidī raksts drošinātājs. Hello, Denis. Hello. War dramatically changes people's lives. Who are those people who decide to leave their previous professions, to take on risks and become deminers in Ukraine right now? So talking my experience working in the demining sector over the last eight years, I could tell, you know, like, I know like different stories from, uh, you know, like three countries which I've been working in majority situation, people who at some point decide to join humanitarian demining sector, they could quite a different background. If you're talking particularly in Ukraine, where more than 50% of our staff have a university degree, you know, like we have a different stories from a different part of the countries, people who decide to be helpful for Ukraine and to change their life and life of the Ukraine. We had a quite interesting stories from the people who was used to be working in the past in a, being engineering, some of them even working as uh, doctors, because there is uh, definitely the crisis in Ukraine, crisis in the labor law sector. People are willing to take different opportunities, and some of them are who join particular our organization. It's uh, changing the lifestyle, and majority of them are really proud that they are doing the mining and they're helping on a daily basis uh, to Ukraine country, to Ukraine society, making the Ukraine mines free. Well, but demining is not really, let's say, a regular job, if, if we can describe it like that. There probably needs to be some more reasons besides only getting a job and getting paid. Yeah, absolutely. I'm agree with you that, you know, like, from one hand, it's demining, it's uh, quite you know, like unique job and it's, you know, for some people it sounds slightly scary to terrifying them. However, based on, you know, like the requirements to become a deminer, we don't have a, a strong, you know, like quite high standard or benchmark to become a deminer. This person shouldn't have any health disabilities, be uh, willing to work and willing to learn. And within the one month, we able to train the person who used to in the past doing very different kind of labor job or whatever, and to able to become a deminer. Of course, there is enough multiple different courses where people are improving their their competencies, their skills, but you know, to become a kind of you know basic level entrance to the our organization, which is deminer, it takes people one month to pass the demining course successfully pass a test in the end and they able to become a deminer. In terms of emigrees, this is you know, quite unique. However, it's not very dangerous, you know, like if people are following the instructions, if they are following the standard operation procedures, this work will be not dangerous and become a, to be a plumber, for example. In uh, almost all of the jobs, uh, there is this uh, trial period. What is your experience? How many people, after working some time, say, no, this is not for me? I thought it's going to be different. Well, in our sector, I would say it's a bit unique, you know, like, because we, you know, like, on a monthly basis, we're training, you know, like, a lot of people. I would say that majority of them realize it, because, you know, what does our training looks like? You go into the uh, training field, which is kind of dummy field, which doesn't have any kind of danger hazardous items. And they are doing the same drills. They, we are teaching them how to clear the land. It's quite difficult, quite exhausting, and it's required a lot of concentration, physical fit. And majority of the people who understand that this is part of dream job for them, they are realizing this in, a, I would say, first couple of days up to the week, and they realize how difficult it could be. You know, like they're making decisions quite often in the beginning of the training, rather than a couple of months afterwards when they start the job with a halo. So this is based on my observation and experience. You represent a um, internationally well-known NGO, Halo Trust. Uh, it's Ukrainian subsidiary. Could you just tell our, our listeners what is Halo Trust and uh, what is its experience in demining operations worldwide? Halo is the biggest and the oldest humanitarian mine action organization. Halo started in Afghanistan in 1988 
as of today, Halo is working over the 30 countries and overall the number of the staff is uh, 12, about 12,000 of the people working across the globe. All these countries, some you know, is affected by the various conflict containing the mines, for the remnants of war hazards. So Ukraine is one of them. Uh, talking in particular of Ukraine program, Halo start working in Ukraine. So uh, registered in 2015 and become operational, start deploying the first teams in the beginning of 2016. I'm joining the Halo in Ukraine in the same time, in March 2016. So since uh, that time, Halo was successfully was working in the east. We was working in uh, Luhansk, in the Donetsk area, uh, where we cleared significant territories back in the time. However, since in Russian invasion in 2022, our uh, program with our staff, we have to move to the areas which is under government control and become operational, first of all, in the north, around the capital, around the Kyiv. And now, as of today, uh, Hello Ukraine has 1,200 employees, and we are working, conducting the humanitarian mine clearance uh, around the seven oblasts in uh, Ukraine. So we are working in the central region, we're working in the east, and we're working in the south. So uh, from this 1,200, we have 1,000 people who we call operational staff. These are people who are doing the, on a daily basis, conducting the demining, uh, removing, identifying, and, you know, other teams are destroying the mines and the hazardous items. We have uh, teams who are responsible for identification of the hazardous areas. We have teams who are liaising with the communities and changing their behavior, reducing the risk of the mine accidents. So Halo is conducting the quite you know numerous activity, which is everything is linked with the humanitarian mine action. Let's imagine that war stopped today. You said you at the moment you have thousand and two hundred employees but thousands of them are, are those who are working in the field. How many employees would you need to do your job as much as you would be happy with at this moment, knowing how many mines there are in Ukraine at the moment? How many people would that be? So it's a difficult question, you know, because like, uh, it's quite often we get in the similar question in terms of how many resources, financial, how, may, how much time you need to clear Ukraine, how many human resources. For now, I don't have a good answer because, first of all, there is a significant territories which is, are not under control of Ukraine. And we know the fact that these territories is also contaminated. In order to answer your question, you know, like you need to answer all three in terms of financial requirements, in terms of duration, how long it takes, and in terms of number of the staff. But before answering these questions, we need, first of all, to make the assessment, assessment of all area and identify the all hazardous areas which is required the clearance and to do the same from other side, which is currently inaccessible, which is, you know, under occupation. Only after this, we able to tell, you know, make a rough calculation and prediction how much it takes the time, resources, funding, etc. But it's definitely, you know, like the whole sector, which is in Ukraine, we had a number of international and national organizations who are working and conducting the clearance. We have uh, national stakeholders like special emergency services, special transport services, who are also conducting the clearance. I mean, I would, I'm going to tell that the current resources is not enough to deal with the scale of the program. And it's going to take decades to clear Ukraine and make it mine free. Previously, Halo been working in the East. There, the level of contamination was quite, I would say, not very high compared to the other contaminated countries. But nowadays, we had a similar situation like in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, where you don't have a, you know, one single items, but you facing on the fields with a mine pattern. What does it mean? Like, you know, it's mines which is laid in one lane and it could be different types of the mines. Could be anti-personnel, you know, like nearby they could be anti-vehicle mines. 
and all this is also contains some unexplored ordnance like different mortars uh, projectiles which is because it will you know all these minefields are quite close or used to be close to the former front line whereas exchange of fire was you know like along the six seven months in some areas it's over the two years so the density of contamination is in some areas is quite insane so as of today you know just working on uh, these new areas which has been allocated to us after the invasion hello already identified over twenty-five thousand hazardous areas and some of them been removed destroyed by the our resources some of them been handed over for future disposal by the third parties so it's a quite big amount of hazardous items however there is more to identify more to clear and more to destroy so it's you know it's quite a big number and unfortunately which each day as the conflict is going on the number of the hazardous items which we have to clear it's just keep increasing do i understand correctly that you even have a formula that each day of war prolongs the work of d miners for so much time there is you know kind of unofficial you know saying but it's quite speculative and you know we can't refer to it you know like and making any forecasts but it's definitely you know like every day you know like, uh, of the war it's definitely adding on the top of the existing contamination adding the another layer and it's making you know like the work of the miners in the future or even now not easier just to make it even worse and making ukrainian land more contaminated but i can ask uh, halo trust as an organization uh, that works in all of these problem areas around the world you as a representative of halo trust can you confirm that ukraine is the area with the biggest mine problem in the world probably you know like kind of i'm going to refer to my previous answer because we can't make these strong statements i would say that it's correct to say that ukraine is one of the most contaminated but for example you know like halo is working on afghanistan over than 30 years and we are keep working you know because afghanistan has a numerous of you know numbers of the wars and the conflicts and the level of contamination they are quite high there is a, some of the countries which is halo completely clear and declare the mind free however in ukraine first of all to you know like to make uh, this strong statement that ukraine is the most contaminated country in the world we need to finish the have access to all the areas and finish the assessment or survey of these areas and only after this we able to make a judgment call in terms of but overall i would say ukraine is definitely in, i would say top five contaminated countries in the world it's really painstakingly slow job is there some new technologies that can help to do this work quicker and what do you say to those who say just blow up and and all the mines will blow up with uh, your controlled explosion or is it like 30 years ago when it's just the work of one person one mine and very slow and very very cautious job i'm partially agree that manual demining is a quite slow process uh, however it's definitely was you know like slowly and slowly improved you know the our procedures since you know like the humanitarian mine action start uh, being a sink and so over the last 30 years the procedure definitely was improving and we as a halo ukraine we are forward leaning towards the technology so as of today we are moving the center of the gravity from the manual clearance to the mechanical clearance so as of today we are what does it mean so we are using the different mechanical assets which is helping the our deminers to make it uh, more quicker more efficient so we are using different remote vegetation cutting machine it's a, like a big low mower 1000 kilograms which is able to remove vegetation able to remove some surface laid mines and able to uh, make a work of the miner i would say five ten times quicker depends on the threat additionally to that we are using the heavy machinery plants like uh, excavators 
different uh, demining machine, which is able to help us with some, depends on the condition, depends on the threat, but definitely able to accelerate the work of the manual clearance. And the last but not least, uh, we also utilize nowadays uh, uh, drone technology. So all our teams who is doing the survey, they are doing using the drones in order to make the uh, work and identification of the mines more efficient. And after we identify the hazardous areas, we also using the more sophisticated drones with the high resolution cameras, and uh, we using the we call it this opportunity window from the end of the autumn until the beginning of the spring before everything become green. We are deploying the drones to the hazard, identify hazardous areas and identifying all the surface items. So it could be mine, it could be projectile, everything. Which And we, by the end of it, we had a good high resolution satellite image with a marked with the help of our specialist mark every items which is was identified on the surface or maybe partially buried which is make the work of our deminers more efficient more safe and more quicker probably there are listeners right now who are wondering why do you actually need uh, civilians as deminers because perception is that uh, mining and demining is something that military does. I would disagree with the statement uh, because, the, first of all, the army capacity and army nowadays is a quite overstretched, and they, uh, you know, like doing all the best in order to protect the country. So there is definitely not never enough of the human resources. That's why it's quite essential. That's you know, like that's civilian is involved in this and dealing with the problem. And I would be not comparing these two activities, a kind of military demining, which is predominantly designed to, you know, like kind of operational purposes, and the humanitarian demining, which is predominantly focusing on uh, civilians, help on uh, communities, help on uh, all the kind of, you know, like some district region, to be making sure that there is, you know, like the, there is no threat to this particular community. How do you decide where to go and work to demine? So we're working on, uh, first of all, there is a National Mine Action Authority in uh, uh, Ukraine, and there is a National Mine Action Center, who are coordinating the numbers of the humanitarian operators in the country, they are allocating, first of all, the areas of operation for each operator. So within these allocated areas to us, we had a prioritization matrix, which is based on a priority of the local administration, based on the priority of the administration. Additionally, it's uh, based on our own humanitarian kind of criteria, you know, like proximity to the settlement of these particular contaminated areas, you know, the facts of whether it's, you know, blocking the access to the critical infrastructure, whether it had in the past the uh, accident or incidents, etc. So all these criteria is combined into the matrix, which is giving us a good sense what is the high priority, low priority or mid priority fields. And we just, you know, picking up the what is the which clearance of which areas will have a, the biggest impact on a community. But how do you gather the information? Do people already know in Ukraine that you have, if you have a mine problem called a, called a Halo Trust or called the army or municipalities are those who are asking for your help in demining operations? I would say both. It's working on a both way. First of all, we had the teams, which is called non-technical survey, which their job within the our area operation to visit every settlement and visit every area which is belong to the settlement and they are responsible to speak with the people, local authority, print, you know, like an you know, army, just the ordinary people who live in this area and who was witnesses in the past of mine laying or fighting. And they are uh, collecting all this data and putting it on a map and identifying the areas required for the clearance. 
However, it's working from also diff, you know, from other end. Uh, the people applying, you know, kind of giving a heads up to the local administration who is creating the prioritization plan and give us a list to such operators like as we are, where we should focus our efforts. So it's kind of combination of the both. You know, and making sure that we are not missing anything in this. And uh, when your D miners go to the field, uh, go to a new place, uh, what is the reaction? They mostly get uh, happiness. The specialists have arrived. Some uh, might be angry that they had to wait uh, for so long. Maybe there are farmers who are angry because you don't let him uh, to work on his field before you demine. What reactions do you get when your D miners get to the place where they have to work? Overall, I would say people are treating our deminers teams quite positive. Everyone understands that we are doing this for Ukraine, for their community. We're doing this for free. Of course, there is, you know, like, there is pressure on the farmers, pressure because they're renting the land. They have to pay their employees and they would like always to be able as soon, as quick as possible to be able to start plowing and utilizing the land and uh, collecting the harvest and they have a, a lot of economical pressure on them so it's quite a common situation in the sector that the agricultural sector would like to make the mining and clearance as quick as possible and you know trying to you know like having the pressure of all overall sector but overall the ordinary civilians they quite i would say in general they are very friendly and they uh, really glad help or help such an organization like what we are doing. I was surprised to find out in one article uh, I read uh, before this interview in which you described a strange problem that uh, when your operational staff get to the location, there are quite often problems with uh, living, finding a living space for them because they cannot travel from Kiev for every day. Could you talk about that, that you have to bring them from further away to to the areas you are demining? Yeah, you are quite right. This is you know, like one of our challenges and uh, which we are working on, reducing all the commit time from the place of, where our demanders are staying, it could be temporary accommodation, or sometimes they could be, you know, like spending, you know, like they could be people from the Kharkiv working in areas from the Kharkiv. But it's in our interest as an employee is to reduce the timing of our team suspending from point A to point B where they're going to do in the work. Uh, quite often in the east and in the south of where we're working, the infrastructure is heavily damaged. So you could be looking for accommodation for our teams in the village, and some of the village uh, has no building which is not impacted by the conflict. You know, like or in some villages in a particular in the south, that might be no local residents at all because all the buildings are destroyed. You know, there is no appropriate accommodation. In order to mitigate this, we are looking for doing some remote camps for our teams that they could be living as close to the their you know kind of task where they're working as close as possible it will minimize the travel time and you know like economical impact logistical impact etc and i understand that the problem also is that uh, from the villages that you are demining and then where you cannot find a undamaged house the people uh, probably moved to the next village where you would try to find a accommodation but there are already displaced people there so you have to go even further away right correct yeah it's quite a common uh, situation you know like because you know like there is a lot of artificially displaced people in the areas where we're working people who are moved from occupied territories who have to relocate from the territories you know which is in the proximity to the front line where is constant shelling is going on and yeah it's quite often that's existing accommodation that's quite overstretched because of numbers of idps and the uh, numbers of the damaged buildings, which is making situation in some of the areas of Ukraine quite difficult to find the 
accommodation. And, uh, you know, I'm not talking about uh, any luxury accommodation. I'm talking about the kind of basic accommodation facilities. That's a challenge for the managers at Halo Trust. But um, if we talk about the D miners and their work, what is the biggest challenge for them? I understand that uh, the military is time to time being quite smart in placing like bombs under bombs, putting trigger uh, wires and stuff like that. What is the biggest challenge that you remind your D miners again and again and again that they have to be wary about? So I would slightly redirect my answer towards a different topic because I would say that the, our D miners, they are not dealing with improvised devices, which you described. The main goal of our D miners is identify the hazardous items and to stop stop his work, raise a hand and ask for the call for the help of the more experienced team leader who is making a judgment call with you know like the, what our deminers are doing. They are preparing the you know kind of area in order to be able to use a detector, identifying the metal signals, follow up with metal signals. As soon as they identify the hazardous items, which is, could be anything, they just asking for the help for more competent staff who will decide whether it's we're able to deal with this or whether we're not, whether we're able to destroy this item or whether we need to hand it over to the you know, like special authorities who is dealing with improvised items. Right. But coming to back to the question, what are the main challenges of our demanders? I would say the, the condition of work. It's quite difficult because you know our demanders are working almost 10 months per year. So we're working from the March till the end of December, having like, you know, about two months on the stand down. But it's quite difficult because we're starting working in the March and the beginning of the year where it's still cold. It could be partial snow, could be cold wind, and, you know, like the weather could be quite miserable. During the summer, you know, Ukraine climate is quite extreme and our demanders are working on, a, you know, like quite high temperature, which is quite difficult. And by the end of the year, close to the Christmas break, it's again the, it's getting quite difficult. And all this time, our people are working outdoor. This is, I would say, the biggest challenges for everyone. You are Ukrainian, right? By nationality. Correct. You have some foreigners working at Halo Trust Ukraine. Correct. Yeah, we have uh, a lot of my colleagues. They have, you know, like they have international staff, and they are. Uh, working in the you know hello ukraine from a different countries do you and your foreign colleagues look at the mine issue in ukraine a bit differently i'm asking this because let's say a princess diana who is uh, very well uh, known and associated with halo trust had campaigned for um, ban of landmines but uh, as we see in case of ukraine landmines are sometimes helping to save ukraine just uh, as a protection from the attacks of invaders. Is there an issue that you look a little bit different at the mines as a Ukrainian uh, than your foreign colleagues at Halo? I would say, you know, like my answer will be quite simple. Mine is mine. Uh, we don't care, you know, like how it's ended up or who laid the mine. What we care about, whether this mine is impacting the life of civilian. And we are working in areas which is being allocated to us by the uh, National Mine Action Center, which is sitting under the Ministry of Defense. And they kind of give us areas which is currently not having the strategical impact of the protection of the country. And, you know, like we treating each mine as a just a risk for the life of civilians. I'm asking this because um, I think a few months ago in Latvia, there was a, quite a big discussion after the Latvian military said that uh, quite many people were surprised uh, that uh, it is military that is saying that, and they couldn't understand why shouldn't we put mines uh, right on the border with enemy and possible invader. As of today, we are not working on uh, any kind of side of the border or you know closer to the border 20 kilometers or closer to the line of contact to 20 kilometers. So we're not making any impact on uh, you know this kind of mine lane protecting mine lane for protecting the ground you know but 
where we focus in is you know on the legacy of the war, where the mines or ERW are not changing any situation. However, it's definitely making the threat on the human's life. But what is your stance? If you want, you can not answer this question, but if Ukrainian military says, well, we need to mine the field just to protect ourselves from the attack of Russian tanks, and then on the other side, you know, as a professional in demining, that it's going to be a problem for decades. What do you say? What should military do? Should they use the mines or shouldn't they use the mines and try to use other means? Well, it's a difficult question for a person who's working in the humanitarian sector, and you're asking quite a tricky one. In short, you know, like I completely disintegrate in these two things. You know, like the army has their own needs, and I'm not in position to make any comments or criticize an army. And we have different targets, different goals, etc. There is definitely the space where we able to work collaborate with each other in order to help Ukraine, help Ukraine to protect their citizens and help Ukraine to be able to protect existing of Ukraine and, you know, like, from invasion. What has been the result of your work so far? So our survey teams identified over than 21 million square meters of the areas which need to be cleared. It has a different type of the threat. It could be mines, unexplored organs of the war. As of today, we cleared a bit more than 4 million square meters. So it's giving you kind of a ratio between how quick a survey and how slightly slower the clearance. And as I mentioned previously, we already identified and uh, dispose or hand over to further disposal more than 25,000 of the hazardous items. So we... As of today, uh, we conduct a lot of sessions, about 20,000 sessions for the local residents and to order to change their behavior and give them the recommendation what's the action required in the identifier the any hazardous item. So, and there is definitely way more work remaining. As of today, we are working on a clearance, 139 teams we are deploying. That's why, you know, like the scale of the problem of Ukraine is quite huge and we definitely need the extra resources in order to overcome and solve them. And I understand that you are financed by different governments. If I go to your webpage, I saw uh, a Latvian flag as well that um, some part of the money is coming from the Latvian taxpayers. What's about the funding of of your organization? Um, Is there everything in place, what you need, or you're actively looking for support more? It's not a part of my remit, particularly the the financial. I'm more focusing on the technical one, but overall I could tell that we are funding on different institutional donors as well as the philanthropy but it's quite important for the you know like for the funding of any kind of countries which is involved on the conflict that the level of funding is remain stable because this is a problem which is can be solved with you know like one money t- uh, transaction it's essential that you know that number of the stuff we employed and uh, on a daily basis during the clearance in Ukraine, it's quite essential that the funding level uh, remain stable over the years. At the moment, you are uh, head of operations department of the Halo Trust in Ukraine, but you started uh, not as a uh, big boss, but at a lower level. Could you just uh, summarize your experience at Halo and what it has taught you about the world and Ukraine and the mines? It's true. I'm starting like, you know, from a basic level and joined non-technical survey team back in 2016 in the east, in the, and not far away from a Halo operational office, which is used to be in Kramatorsk back in the time. I was working over these eight years on the numbers of the different uh, positions, slowly progressing, and Halo, um, you know, like, trained me a lot and gave me the skills, knowledge. I spent two and a half years working in the Middle East doing you know also conducting the survey and helping with mechanical clearance and rubble removal in libya 
which is also has uh, seen a lot of conflict and fighting back in the time. I spent uh, a bit less than a year working in uh, Sri Lanka, which is has uh, also the legacy of the old conflict and the level of contamination there is quite huge. You know, not the same size or which is currently in Ukraine, but the density of contamination is quite high, similar to Ukraine. So, and yeah, uh, nowadays, you know, like, uh, I'm working in Ukraine, for Ukraine, and which is making me proud. It's a quite challenging job. However, you know, like, it's quite honorable because you're realizing that you're helping your country, it's, which is making me proud. What conclusions can you get from experience abroad in these countries? Do you think people in Ukraine or around the world understand the scope of the problem that Ukraine faces uh, uh, with the issue of mines? So first of all, like each country which has a mine contamination is unique. It's unique in terms of type of contamination, the nature of the conflict, the areas which is affected by contamination. So there is uh, numerous aspects which need to be taken into account before try to compare the two different countries. So similar with uh, you know like some methods you know like in general they're similar but you know if some clearance method or etc work in one country it doesn't mean that it's going to be working in the, because the source you know the type of mines type of strand the type of the you know, like the intensity of the war, etc., it's quite different from conflict to conflict. And again, duration of also is quite essential because in some countries, the conflict has been, you know, like for, you know, like a year or so, some of them was, you know, like a decade, etc. And again, when it was, because, you know, like by the time some of the uh, hazardous items become less operational, less dangerous, however, it still contains the danger. So at the end of every interview, we ask our guests, what should we wish you personally? Of course, the end of the war and victory, but what else? Huh. Uh, I reckon, you know, like you, in your question, you already have an answer. You know, like I wish, you know, like the first of all, the end of the war, which is, you know, like it's a dream uh, for all Ukrainians. Right. It's uh, something which is, you know, United whole Ukraine, and you know, it makes the whole, every Ukrainian think absolutely the same. All right, thank you so much, Dennis. Well, you have a lot of work to do, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you for your time. Paldies divām, kurš sarunājās ar Denisu Golovecki, de Halo Trust, Ukrainas nodaļas operāciju vadītāju. Jā, nu skaidrs, ka darba būs vēl daudz, un runājot jau ne tikai par mīnām, arī par dažādiem citiem nespraugušiem priekšmetiem, jau vēl pēc kara beigām, nu no jau noslēpums, ka arī pēc otrā pasaules kara beigām mēs joprojām kaut kur atrodam pa kādam nespraugušam lādiņam, kas diemžēl dažos gadījumos pat beidz letāli, jo kāds no to atradējiem vēlas pats pārbaudīt, kas tad lācītim vēderā to nu gan nevajadzētu darīt. Tur tās divas trakās lietas. Viens ir tas, ka tiešām civili iedzīvotāji ar tie, kur visvairāk cieš. It sevišķi, ja mēs runājam par bērniem vai ne, kur dzīvo kaut kādos lauku teritorijās, ieskrien mežā vai laukā vai vēl kaut ko redz, kaut kas tur mētājas, jo tagad tās mīnas jau nav tikai tādas acīma redzamas, ir, ir tādas, kas izskatās, nezinu, pēc mazai plasmas gabaliem atliek paņemt rokās un tev rokas vairāk nav. Otra trākākā lieta ir tāda, ka šajās te piefrontas zonās šīs ir mīnas, kuras tiek vienkārši izšautas un tad viņas tiek izkaisītas pa lielu plašu teritoriju un bez šādiem te atmīnēšanas operācijām, kur tiešām tiek pa, pa centimetram pārbaudīt zeme, nav iespējams būt pilnībā drošiem. Līdz ar to tu var dzīvot laukos, bet nekur nevar paspērt pa labu, pa kreisu solu, jo tāpēc, ka vienkārši nezin, vai tevi tur nesagaida nāvas draudi vai trauma uz mūžu. Tik tālā par atmīnēšanas operāciju Ukrainā, kas vēl būs aktuāli gadu gadiem, diemžēl, Ja jums šī saruna šķita interesanta, aizsūtiet uh, saiti ar, ar to ka saviem draugiem radiem paziņām, vai arī uh, raksiet mums, ko jūs domājat par uh, dzirdēto 
Drošinātājs at Latvijas Radio LV ir mūsu e-pasta adrese, un tagad pirms ieraksts ielūkojos, apskatījos, o mums jāienākošas vairākas jūs vēstules, un tad, lai nebūtu sajūta, ka mēs tās ignorējam, es tad gribēju nedaudz nocitēt, piemēram, Ingus Skuplais mums ir atrakstījis, ka viņu ir sajūsminājis Kristīnas Bērziņas pagājušajā epizodē teiktie vārdi, pašās pēdējās viņas runas sekundēs, kuras Kristīna saka, ka uzvarēs nevis armijas un spēks, bet cilvēki un cilvēcība. Ingus saicina noklausīties vēlreiz pašiem Kristīnas teikto un es, protams, varu tikai pievienoties Ingum. Savukārt Mārtiņš Biezais ir atrakstījis mums arī vēstuli, sakot un patiesībā paceļot tad ļoti svarīgi jautājumu. Viņš ir klausies vairākas desmitas mūsu epizožu, paldies liels Mārtiņu par to. Un Mārtiņam arī ir radies viedoklis, ka drošinātājs pauž caur šīm te intervijām un caur mūsu saturu, pauž visnotaļ heroisku un samērā homogēnu viedokli par procesiem karā Ukrainā, kā arī par sagaidāmo un vēlamo kāra iznākumu. Raksta Mārtiņš, manuprāt, paužot tikai vienpusē skatījumu uz jautājumu, mēs radām risku nesagaidīt to iznākumu, uz kuru esam tik ļoti fokusējušies. Šāda vilšanās var būt nevien psiholoģiski grūta, bet arī iespējams radīt labvēlīgu augsni vietējo alternatīvo viedokļu paudēju vēlākajām gavilēm. Man jāsaka, es pilnīgi piekrītu Mārtiņam par to, ka ir jābūt ļoti uzmanīgiem ar to, kā mēs runājam, Protams, ka visādi citādi, piemēram, ir reizes, kad mēs intervijas beidzam ar tekstu Slavu Ukrainai, un tad man pašam ir bijušas pārdomas par to, vai profesionāls žurnālists var šādi te nostāties kaut kādā pusē, un, un šajā gadījumā ir šis te izņēmums, kad, jā, nu man ir pilnīgi skaidrs, kā pusē es esmu, es neslēpi to, bet te nav tikai stāsts par Ukraini pret Krieviju. Tu esi domāju, tie, kur mūs klausās, visi vairāk vai mazāk ir homogēni šajā ziņā. Bet uh, tas jautājums, par ko runā tieši Mārtiņš, ir, vai mēs varbūt pārāk maz runājam par kaut kādām ēnas pusēm. Un šis jautājums man arī ir kādu laiku bijis man pakausī, par ko es esmu domājis, jo skaidrs, ka ne jau visi Ukrainā ir varoņi, par to mēs esam runājuši, man liekas, pirms nedēļām trijām, četrām, kad uh, mēs runājām par cilvēkiem Ukrainā, kuri izvairās no dienēšanas armijā. Es kādu laiku veltīju mēģinājumiem atrast kādu cilvēku, kurš būtu gatavs runāt par šo tēmu mūsu lielās intervijas formātā. Diemžēl man tas nav izdevies, ja jūs zinat kādu Ukrainas pilsoni, kurš izvairās no dienestu un viņam ir ļoti skaidri pamatojums sapratni par to, kādēļ to viņš dara, tad atsūtiet mums kontaktu, sazināsimies, parunāsim par to. Un ir daudz vēl tēmu, kuras raisa jautājums. Bet godīgi sakot ir tā, ka kara laikā mēs arī droši vien kaut kā sevi cenzējam, ka no vienas puses negribas runāt par kaut kādām lielām problēmām, tādējādi neradot augsni Ukrainas nelabvēļiem, no otras puses, ja mēs runājam tikai par labo, tad mēs paši kaut kādā veidā safabricējam realitāti, vai arī paši sevi uzkurinam uz to, ka jā, Ukraina tūlīt vinnēs un Ukraina, Ukraina atgūs visas teritorijas un tas prasīs divas, trīs nedēļas. Nu, mums ir bijuši šī pieredze, vai arī, piemēram, kad atceries, Rihard, tad, kad bija runa par Abrams tankiem, ka lūk, Amerikāņi iedoros Abrams tankus un tad, nu, tad, nu, gan kara laukā Ukraina demolēs Krievas un tūlīt visu atgūs. Nu, nenotika tā. Tās mums ir mūsu pašu mācības kuras ir gūtas kara laikā, nu nav tādu brīnumu ieroču, ir negatīvās lietas Ukrainas pusē arī, bet, nu jā, mēs mēģinām atrast to balansu starp pozitīvajām lietām un ļoti uzmanīgi skatāmies, kā runāt par negatīvajām. Viena no tēmām, par kuru es jau kādu gadu, nē, vai pat ilgāk, sev esmu rakstījis bluciņā manā folderītī atsevišķa sadaļa par korupciju Ukrainā. Tā ir tēma, kas, no kuras nevar izbēgt runājot par Ukrainu. Mēs zinām, pirms kārtā tā bija viena no korumpētākajām valstīm reģionā, turpat apmēram, kur Krievija, bet kara gaitā, kad tu runā ar cilvēkiem un atkal jau šis ir vai, vai tā ir realitāte, vai tā ir mana tikai iedomātā vēlme, cerēt, ka pēc šāda te 
nežēlīgi kara ar tik nežēlīgiem iznākumiem, kad mirst drosmīgākie Ukrainas ļaudis. Vai te nav stāsts tikai par to, ka mēs tagad atbrīvosim Ukrainu, proti Ukraiņu paši, ja? ka viņi atbrīvos savu valsti. Kam viņi to dara? Kam viņiem ir vajadzīga savu valsts? Lai tā būtu otra Krievija? Nu, droši vien, ka nē. Un varbūt šis mans ir tāds wishful thinking, kā saka, ka pēc kara Ukrainai ir jābūt citādai valstī, nekā tā bija pirms tam, un ja Krievija ir viņu pretstats, tad viņi gribētu būt maksimāli pretēji tam, kas ir Krievija šobrīd. Un tas skar arī korupciju. Un ņemot vērā arī drošinātāju formātu, kad mēs mēģinām runāt par personīgiem stāstiem. Un šis ir slikts brīdis, kad par to runāt, jo tāpēc, ka šajā nedēļā interviju bija vairāk tomēr par tēmu kopumā, un tas nav tas mūsu jājam zirdziņš. Bet šis bija tas gadījums, kad Denis tuvi radinieki vēl aizvien ar okupētajās teritorijās, un viņš ļoti nevēlējās runāt tieši par personīgajām lietām, lai nekaitētu kaut kā saviem radiniekiem, tāpēc arī mums bildi ir atsūtīti tikai viena viņa un no sāniem tā, ka viņa sejīt nav saskatām. Tas pats arī attiecas uz viņa kaut kādiem publiski pieejamām informācijām Halo lapā un tam līdzīgi. Tad, nu jā, un mēs parasti meklējam šos personīgos stāzes, bet ir izņēmumi. Un izņēmums būs arī nākamajā nedēļā, jo Ja es visu laiku gaidīju, gadu gaidīju, kad personīgi stāstu par korupciju Ukrainā, bet no ar ko runāt ar kādu korumpantu vai ar korupcijas apkarotāju vai ko. Nu, redz, un dažreiz ir tā, ka domā, domā un nekas nenotiek šajā ziņā, bet tad Rihards sēdz, ka viņš brauc uz Igauniju, uz Stalinu, uz kādu konferenci, un tur būšot arī viena liela speciālista par korupcijas jautājumiem Ukrainā. Te es piesaku, jau nākamās nedēļas mūsu viesi, bet par to tuč, tuč, neatkalājot visas kārtas, Rihard, tu varētu pastāstīt. Jā, nu vēl tik piebilstot informatīvajā telpā, mēs redzam brīžiem optimistiskāku, brīžiem pesimistiskāku informāciju un atspoguļojumu tam, kas notiek Ukrainā, vairāk varbūt esam pieraduši to negatīvismu redzēt tieši par notikumiem nu, vai par situāciju frontē, bet nav jau tā, ka Ukrainā pašā iekšpolitiski nebūtu, protams, dažādu problēmu, un viena no tām lielajām problēmām ir korupcija, kas ir bijusi jau diezgan ievērojama, nu, pielīdzinām arī Krievijas līmenim jau pirms kara, un jā, laika gaitā situācija ir uzlabojusies, bet nu, vēl ir ļoti daudz darāmā. Un tev tiesi, es biju Igaunijā, biju Tallinā, Lennarta Meri konferencē, kas ir veltīt drošības jautājumiem, un tur es arī sastapu pārstāvi no nevalstiskās organizācijas pretkorupcijas rīcības centrs, Olenu Halušku, parunājos ar viņu par to, kā tad Ukrainai ir gājis visus šos gadus, cik liela korupcija bija pirms tam, cik liela tā ir tagad, kādās jomās tā ir, ko tad viņa dara arī savā nevalstiskajā organizācijā, lai nu, mēģinātu šo tā situāciju mainīt, kas ir tās sviras, ar ko to ir iespējams darīt, cik vispār grūti to šobrīd ir darīt, proti veikt reformas arī kara laikā un gal galā, kāpēc, jā, tu jau minēji, kāpēc tas vispār ir nepieciešams, kādā Ukrainā, Ukraiņa tad vēlas dzīvot nākotnē un kāpēc ir nepieciešams tomēr šo tā korupciju izskaust. Nu, tas pēc nedēļas. Laipni aicināt klausīties, ja jūs mūs klausīties ar kādu laiku nobīt, tad vienkārši spiežat uz next podziņas nākamo mūsu epizodu klausīties, ja nē, tad jāpagaida nedēļa. Un liels paldies Mārtiņam, biezajam par vēstuli un ļoti, man liekas, loģisks un pamatots viedoklis un, un droši rakstiet mums to, ko jūs domājat, tas arī mums palīdz būt formā un kaut kā neaizplūst, nezinu, kur tur, kur varbūt nevajadzētu aizplūst. Jā, sadarbojamies, sadarbojamies un, ja jūs drošinātāji saturs interesē, tad mums ir tikai prieks un, ja jūs iesaisties tā, tā satura veidošanā, tā vai citādi, ar saviem padomiem un komentāriem un kritiku, tad man ir tikai lielāka pārliecība, ka um, mēs varam piedāvāt to, kas tiešām ir tā vērts, lai klausītos. Nu ko, tas šai reizei arī viss. Šonedēļ bija runa par atmīnēšanas, mega darbu Ukrainā nākamdēļ runāsim par korupciju, pēc tam jau mums ir vēl dažas epizodes priekšā. Jāņu nedēļā ir 
gaidām šīs sezonas pēdējā epizode, tad mēs uz kādu brītiņu no jums atvadīsimies, bet šobrīd mēs atvadamies tikai līdz nākamai nedēļai. Paldies, ka klausījāties, paldies, ka bijāt kopā ar mums un atcerieties. Jauna epizode katru ceturtu dienu un drošinātājs, tas ir skaidri un personīgi par karu Ukrainā. Raidīraksts drošinātājs.